Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Tony Glass, Philip Less, and Daniel Dorado. Coming up on DTNS, Getty Images bans AI-made art from its platform. Google lets you edit search results about yourself. And should vehicles try to detect drunk drivers and lock them out? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 21st. Do you remember the 21st night of September 2022 in Los Angeles? I'm Tom Merritt. I am not Guy Fox, but I am Scott Johnson from the city next to the Great Salt Lake. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Amazon refreshed its Fire HD 8 tablets. I guess they weren't good enough for next week's announcement, uh, but they've added a 30% faster six-core processor. They have generally thinner, lighter design, 13-hour battery life. The standard $100 HD 8 will give you two gigabytes of RAM and wired charging. And if you pay an extra 20 bucks for the $120 HD 8 Plus, you get three gigabytes of RAM, wireless charging, and a little bit better camera. Both support tap to Alexa features, so you can control the assistant with touch commands a ruggedized kids version which is kind of normal for amazon to offer that uh costs you 50 dollars more so either 150 or 170 depending on whether you want the plus you got to serve those ruggedized kids i always say uh as tom mentioned yesterday windows 11's first big feature update is here with a customizable start menu voice access system-wide captioning touch gestures and more check windows update in the settings to see if it is available yet for you if you are on a machine that can't run Windows 11, Windows 10 version 2020, sorry, 22H2 will arrive in October. Uh, that will be more than just a security update, though. Microsoft has not detailed what features it will be, though, so you'll have to wait for that. Uh, Microsoft also announced it will hold a Surface event on October 12th at 10 a.m. Eastern to show off new devices. Yeah, just a Surface event. Just going to touch the... <laughs> <laughs> get it nice. yeah yeah never get tired of that one uh framework and google have announced the framework laptop chromebook edition so it is a user upgradable framework laptop like their windows laptops but runs chrome os instead of windows it supports framework's expansion card system uh, if you don't know that gives you four hot swappable slots so that you can decide at any moment which ports you want and which side of the laptop you want them on and swap them out as you needed. Uh, you can choose between USB-C, USB-A, micro SD, HDMI, DisplayPort, Ethernet, and high-speed storage uh, and mix and match. You can also upgrade the RAM inside of a framework laptop and the storage that's inside and swap out bezels on the display if you want to change colors. If you want this Chrome OS version of the laptop, pre-orders begin today in the U.S. and Canada, starting at $999, shipping in early December. YouTube did a cool thing, I think, anyway. They announced a beta for Creator Music, which will offer a catalog of songs that can be used for monetized videos. Creators can either pay for a songs directly or split monetization revenue with the license holder of that song. Terms of the licensing and revenue split are spelled out when selecting tracks. YouTube also updated its partner program to share ad revenue with YouTube Shorts creators. That's a long time coming. Uh, early next year, qualified creators will get a 45% cut of ad revenue from those Shorts videos. Oh, good. Yeah, giving people a path to, you know, legally pay for the music instead of forcing them to break the law if they wanted to use it. I think that's a smart idea. Uh, yeah. NVIDIA announced the launch of Omniverse Cloud, with services that will let artists and developers design, publish, and operate what they called metaverse applications, basically 3D stuff. Uh, you get the power of big data centers running NVIDIA GPUs to do your 3D workflow. Pretty cool stuff if you're working in 3D animations and avatars and that sort of thing. Uh, NVIDIA is betting on universal scene description, or unfortunately acronym USD, not US dollar, universal scene description as the future standard, or as they called it, the HTML of the metaverse. Omniverse Cloud is based on the USD standard, and it's NVIDIA's first big software as a service offering. But the big takeaway, if you like being in the know on buzzwords and acronyms, in my opinion, uh, is before it gets big, you know that USD does not mean US dollar. In the metaverse, it's going to mean universal scene description. I'm actually legit excited about this, and I'm sure this will come up on later episodes when it becomes available, but I think it's a bold move in a new place that people like Adobe aren't ready for. So, yeah. 
it's too early to call USD the standard of anything that might eventually be called the metaverse. And yes, uh, it's really hard to keep my eyes from rolling when I say the word metaverse. <laughs> uh, but if you strip all that away, uh, having a standard that's not from NVIDIA, it's an outside standard, and, and having a, a cloud service for making 3D stuff, I think is really cool. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is exciting buzzwords aside. All right, let's talk a little more about Google delivering on a promise. Promises made, promises kept from Google. Let's find out. At Google I.O. this year, Google announced results about you. Some of you may remember this, a feature that would let you remove some information about yourself from search results. Well, now that feature is rolling out to users in Europe and the U.S., so I guess promises kept. We'll see how it goes. In the Google app for Android, if uh, yours has been updated, of course, you can tap on your profile avatar, select the results about you uh, as the menu item. That takes you to a page that explains how that you can do this actual request for the removal and uh, that takes you out of the search results. If they contain a phone number, home address, or other personally identifiable information, identifiable information like ID numbers, account numbers, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a good point. This is not right to be forgotten. That's a European law about, uh, I would like that embarrassing story about me being arrested taking down. It's not untrue. I just don't think it should be up anymore. This is about doxing. Somebody put up my address, my phone number, my bank account number, and I would like that not to show up from search results. You can make a request from a page while you're searching. If you're looking at search results in the app, you can uh, click on the three dot menu by the result and then choose remove result. Once you do that, you can track the progress of your request on that results about you page that Scott just mentioned. Uh, not all Google app users are going to see this right away. If you don't see it in your particular Google app, I didn't see it in mine on my Android phone. Uh, you just hang in there. It'll slowly roll out to everybody. However, if you do have an immediate need to remove results, there's a web page you can go to. We'll have a, a link in the show notes. It, it's not real uh, snappily said out loud. It's support.google.com slash web search slash slash answer and slash nine six seven three seven three oh uh you probably search for it too though yeah i've got a lot of questions about this um they're they've been swimming around my head all morning but i do wonder about one thing in particular um these this obviously must be fielded by ai and robots and bots and stuff because th this is too much for some individual at some uh terminal to to probably manage given the potential size of how many requests you'll get per day that only concerns me a little bit because and maybe not that much more than if a human being was doing it, but it feels like this might be a situation that gets a little in the weeds when you say, sure, uh, I can't take down an article that's about me being arrested because that's just true and I don't really get to control that. But what if it's an article that somebody wrote that was slanderous about you? Um, as just an example, if they said a bunch of things that were absolutely demonstrably not true, and you have very little recourse to have it taken down. I suppose you go through legal hoops to do it, but maybe you don't have the resources to do that. Can this remedy that at all? I, I don't know. I don't know what the granularity is because they don't really uh, detail it. It makes perfect sense to me that if it's personally identifiable, doxable information, super simple and easy. I don't know how the robots decide you're telling them there's, the truth. There's no robots. This can't be people, this, though, right? It's too Google big. Google says it's important to note that when we receive removal requests, we will evaluate all content on the web page to ensure that we're not limiting the availability of other information that is broadly useful, for instance, in news articles. Yeah, when they say we, I think they include They're doing manual buddies. review, my friend. Really? Yeah. Is this that seems enormous? Okay, if they do, there's I say probably, props to I'm, that. I'm not going to say it's entirely 100 percent manual. There's probably some filtering on one end. You're probably right, but they are definitely putting humans in the process here to make sure. Well, that would be a nice change because most of the my interactions with YouTube and other Google know, services yeah. where I have issues, it's all robots all the time. So, so if that's true, that's actually that's really good news to my ears because I think this is a more personal thing. This is the kind of thing that that, that needs uh, the touch of another human being, for lack of a better way of saying it, to to intervene and say, yeah, this uh, this is absolutely what he says it is or whatever. Because um, if computers are deciding that, we're going to have false positives, false negatives, it's just going to get weird. And this won't be perfect, but I think I think I'm leaning toward liking this. Um, I just I just don't know what the granularity is. Like, at what point can I stop getting successful requests? Not that I'd be doing it all day, but you know. Like what kinds of requests seem reasonable that aren't going to get chosen and which ones aren't. Again, and again, yeah. it's the weeds. So that, that's why know. that's why I made the point that this isn't the right to be forgotten. Uh, so this is not about 
this article is embarrassing, but it's true. Those don't count here. That's an entirely yeah. different process, and it's only in Europe. This right. is, it shows my personal contact info. It shows my contact info with an intent to harm me. It shows other personal info about me. Pers this is all about personal info, uh, or it contains illegal information, information that is illegal for people to show, or it's outdated, uh, which I that that's the the one category that I'm like, oh, so if somebody's saying mail Tom at 608 Maple Street, uh, Arlington, Virginia, I'll be like, yeah, I don't, I haven't lived there in years. That's out to get that get that out of there. That's not right. Uh, sure. I feel like that's. That's interesting that that's in there as well. But most of this is there's data about me that shouldn't be seen or is wrong to be seen. That makes sense. I wonder if there's a way to um, like if you had a, a, an about Tom page and on that page you had some personally identifiable information that you wanted there. Yeah. Right? I, for whatever reason you wanted it there. Could I as some, I don't know, outsider mm -hmm. go into there, right click that and go, hey. This should be taken down to mess with you and your no, discoverability. Again, that first of all, you have to do it from your from your logged in account. Remember that mm -hmm. you you, yeah. you mentioned you have to tap on your personal profile. So you're already telling Google, here's who I am. So mm -hmm. it's gonna look and go like, well, Scott, that information isn't about you. Yeah. Toss toss it, right? <laughs> uh right. And, and so I think that's a that's a huge part of that. Um if if you were able to like create an account where you were pretending to be me, uh, there's still other ways that can go. Wait, this account wasn't created recently, and that's where the review comes in and stops that stuff. So I, I feel like I'm not gonna, I n would never say what you're talking about is impossible because there are always ways, but I feel like it's unlikely, at least unlikely to happen a lot. I like our chances better now that I know there are humans involved. So mm -hmm. that is good to know. Yep. Uh, uh, moving on. Let's check this out. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB, you may have heard of them, has recommended measures leveraging new in-vehicle technologies that can limit or prohibit impaired drivers from operating their vehicles, as well as technologies to prevent speeding. That's a direct quote. So what are we actually talking about here? Yeah. Okay. So here is what they said in their published proposal. Uh, incentives to get manufacturers to adopt speed adaptation systems. These are systems that range from simple warnings, you're going too fast, to actual electronic limits that would slow you down. Uh, this would not be required. This is also not the first time the NTSB has recommended it before. Feels to me like they're just tacking this on. Like, we're doing this other thing that's going to get a lot of headlines, so maybe we'll run this in front of you again. The one that people are really paying attention to is require. So that's different. Uh, not, hey, we suggest, this is a really good idea. Require all new vehicles that are sold in the United States to implement passive alcohol impairment detection or advanced driver monitoring or both that would prevent or limit vehicle operation if it detects that you are impaired. Now, if you're out there saying like, well, wait, we have vehicle breathalyzers that are attached to starters. A lot of people, if you get convicted of drug driving, have to do those to get back the right to drive. That's existed for years. The NTSB is recommending a more passive approach than that. Not a blow into your breathalyzer every time you want to start your car, uh, but instead uh, have some kind of system that passively monitors you. And if it thinks you look drunk, then it intervenes. Interesting. Well, Volvo announced that its EX90 SUV will include a driver monitoring system that reads facial expressions to detect distraction or drunk driving. It will attempt to warn uh, distracted drivers. And if it doesn't get a response, slow down and stop the car automatically right over to the side of the road. Yeah, this is I, I can I can see all, all the sides of this. Where, where, where are you at with this one? Um, I'm kind of, oh man, I, this is talk about one I've gone back and forth on. Um, I'm worried because as I read this, I hear the det facial detection or remote detection with other technologies, whatever those technologies may be. What do you do if it turns out it's somebody in the early stages of Parkinson's and they, they are still allowed to drive legally, but you are detecting some abnormalities in the way that they drive. I would hate to see these people get lumped into this kind of impairment where you're intoxicated. Um, so I have, I have worries about false positives and, and, and things like that. Like with anything, I, I feel that way. But I also really like the idea of these technologies getting better and better that can actually detect, you know, motion and translate that to whatever it thinks it means. I mean, it, it feels a little bit like, well, we're going to decide for you. And, and that feels bad to me. But at the same time, I'm like, well, yeah, well, what if I what if we do catch somebody who's way drunk, doesn't realize it, got behind the wheel, thought he was fine for the mile and a half home, isn't actually. 
Um, and then we're going to save lives, maybe his and maybe those he run, comes in contact with in the same way that mandatory seatbelts save lives. Um, but the, the difference between these two is that seatbelts, you can see that through line of we did all this testing. It saved this many lives. We now have this data. It's easy to find and read. Therefore, it makes sense to make these a, a mandate slash law. Where it comes to this, I, I don't know what that I don't know what the through line is. Like, what's the straight line? There really isn't one. Yeah, I, much. I, I, I go, like I said, I go, I go many ways on this. Uh, on the one hand, it's a it's a little bit like those those edge cases uh, where you're like, well, I, I don't want the result. Right. I don't want someone who is drunk driving a car. I don't want someone impaired driving a car where right. it gets weird is is the so how good is this? How how good is this at detecting? Because what I also don't want is me getting in a car and the car saying you're drunk and me going, I haven't touched a drop. You know, I, I've, I've been sober for a decade or or all your life. You know, like what what's going on? I feel like those are knee jerk reactions to any kind of proposal like this. And sure. that they they there are always ways around them to say like okay well we'll come up with ways to deal with individual cases where someone has a condition that just tends to set this off and we'll figure that out that is important to do and that's why the NTSB is just proposing this not putting it uh, in place right this is this is something that that they're they're testing the waters on uh, but but yeah I I I like the idea of it detecting and saying hey you're drunk i feel like once it does that if it does that with a very high level of accuracy it's irresponsible not to have it reduce the ability of the car to drive right sure yeah well it'll be interesting to see how this plan pans out and i love the idea of the tech and i hope the implementation is not you know too much of a headache yeah uh, let us know what, what where, where you fall on this. Like, are, are you like, you know what, even if it means drunks get to drive sometimes, I don't want the government, uh, requiring cars to have this. Or do you feel like, you know what, let's prove that it's accurate, but if it's accurate and maybe that's like a seatbelt, like Scott was saying. Uh, what do you want to hear us talk about the show, too? Another way to participate is get in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Getty Images told The Verge it no longer lets users upload and sell illustrations generating or used ra uh, using rather text to image generation stuff like Dali or Dali Mini or Mid Journey or any of those. Uh, it's the largest image marketplace, by the way, yet to put in such a policy. Newgrounds, Purpleport, and Fur Affinity have all similar restrictions. Shutterstock, though, seems to be the only one who's letting you still have the AI generated art. Mm, yeah, it's limited search results, though, so that, that you can't find AI generated art. If oh, you know. that's oh, see, I missed that part. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. OK, mm. Getty is doing this because they're concerned about the legal implications. Uh, the question of who owns a piece of art generated by an algorithm has not been tested in court. Uh, the terms of service of these companies grant ownership to the user in almost all cases. So if your mind jumps to that, like, oh, is MidJourney going to try to claim they own a thing if it gets really popular? It doesn't seem like that's going to be the problem. Since the machine models, though, are trained on copyrighted works, there is some concern that the derivative works might be considered to infringe on the original works that the model was trained on. And sort of a similar concern is that if the algorithm can generate something in the style of, say, Scott Johnson, uh, especially if it was trained on Scott Johnson's work, does Scott get to say, like, oh, that's, a, that's a not a fair use uh, of my art? Uh, this has not been tested in court. Like I said, collecting the images for training appears to be protected under the same laws that allow you to index uh, websites like search engines. So there's no nothing illegal about collecting the art and training your model with it. But what is less certain is whether the art that results from that being trained on copyrighted works is a fair use of those copyrighted works. And the thing to remember about fair use is it's not a right. It's a defense. You are, when you're using fair use, you're saying, yes, I infringed on copyright, but I had a fair use case to do so and I shouldn't be punished for it. Uh, it is not certain which way a judge would rule regarding algorithmically generated art based on training from copyrighted works. 
Well, in the meantime, sites like Getty are playing it a little bit safe, and I don't blame them. I blame them. Getty will rely on users to identify and report images that violate this rule. That's also working with the Coalition of Content Providence, uh, Providence rather, and Authenticity to create some filters, which I also think is a great idea. Uh, one could presume an algorithm could be trained to look for words created by an algorithm, but mostly Getty's avoiding liability by having the policy in place. Yeah, just just putting the policy up gives them some defense. Uh, and then making the effort uh, really helps. If if somebody did try to sue Getty, they could say, no, it was against our policy. Here's what we did to try to stop it. Uh, go after the person who, who made the made the thing. Go after Mid-Journey. Go after somebody else. We were trying to stop it. So Getty's just trying to take themselves out of the equation right now. Uh, w. Scottis one says, someone should try a lawsuit so we can test it. And <laughs> that will happen. Uh, we're we're after, uh, I I think what I would remind people is that uh, if you're an artist, you may want to use these as a tool. In fact, we've talked before on the show that creating the text that gives you the result you want is harder than a lot of people think. If you haven't tried this, go try it. Uh, Scott, I hope it's okay to say, like, if you try to imitate Scott Johnson's art by telling uh, Mid Journey to make it, it's it's probably not going to make it as well as Scott yet, unless you get really good. If you're mm -hmm. able to make it do Scott's artwork credibly, you probably will realize you had to put a lot of work in that. Like that itself is an artistic skill. It's a skill of description and a skill of imagination and 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 a skill of being able to work with the AI. But but it's not as easy as like, well, now anybody can just say, make a Scott thing. And then, <laughs> you know, all of his work comes out. Yeah. If you said uh, draw a tree like Scott Johnson, A, you got to figure out which one. There's a popular Marvel Comics artist named Scott Johnson. There's a bunch of other, other artists with the same name. So you got that whole thing. These little three, four word sentences you'd see people use on Dolly Mini on Twitter or whatever. It ain't going to cut it. It's not going to work that way. There's, there's skill in it. You're absolutely right. And there's also so much more to training these AI models to, to, to match up with certain styles. And sometimes it's not even just an artist style. It's an era, er, an era's style. Like we want to be classic, mm -hmm. you know, a post-Roman rule uh, era of art. Okay, cool. What does that mean? Has it been trained to do that? On the other hand, there are a couple of situations where I think there's real value in this. I may even brought this up on the show before. So forgive me if I've brought this up, but... Uh, or if you're hearing it twice, the idea that you are, let's say, a small game developer and you've got a computer RPG plan, CRPG, that's a lot like the Baldur's Gate games. You've got characters to create and you've got profiles to choose and those include avatars. And so when you're setting up your character, you're like, well, I want him to be a big old, uh, you know, orc looking dude, or I want to be this, this kind of mysterious looking hooded figure human who's going to be my thief or whatever it is. Those games give you sometimes hundreds, maybe less, but usually hundreds of choices of what to choose. Uh, different genders, different faces, different races, different all these things within the D&D &D universe and, and construct. If you told that, that small game developer, you no longer have to pay somebody to draw and paint every single one of these images. A computer model can do it in a certain era's style, a painterly, oil painty style, and, and, and cram those all out in about five minutes. Why wouldn't you do that? Like, that's amazing. It doesn't address any of these legal issues, and then some of that's got to suss itself out. But that sounds like a huge boon to that level of creator. And it doesn't necessarily mean that at higher levels, artists are going to be pushed out as well. I think a lot of this is just unknown, but I'm optimistic. The more, the closer we get to this stuff. So you're, I'm, you're I'm not worried better. about people imitating you. Uh, I'm not, because they can't. I don't think it's possible yet. I think it will be possible one day. Um, it may not be me they focus on. They'll focus because on, you know. I wonder if we need a law, and I and, and we can argue about where the law should draw the line, but I wonder if there's something in there similar to protecting your likeness. So, for instance, I can't, uh, if even if I look like George Clooney, I mean, God bless me if I could look like George Clooney. I don't. <laughs> but even if I looked like George Clooney, I couldn't go make a commercial and pretend to be George Clooney because that would be using his likeness. 
right? If I implied yeah. that I was him, uh, right. maybe there's something similar to that that needs to be set for this. Like you, you can use uh, text to image generators as long as you're not trying to pass yourself off as an actual artist because it can imitate their style, right? I, f- I feel like that's the template here and that everything else should be fine. It's, if, I, if I'm an artist who used text to image to generate my art, uh, there's an art to that. Maybe I, I then did a lot of refining on it, which requires artistic skill of a more traditional sort. Uh, and yeah, we talked about yesterday's show about the kinds of things like the game game designers uh, wanting to be able to use it to just speed up things and, and do more things. So sure, I, I sure. do think I do think there's going to be there's going to need to be a law. And I also think that before we get a law, there'll be plenty of court cases that will make uh, a version of what should be legal and not uh, out of what the laws that exist, which is never as good as actually creating something new fit for purpose. Yeah. The only other thing I would add is it's possible that we'll get to a science fiction end on this where a famous artist is about to pass and they want to pass on their skill to another and that uh, that another might be an AI. We do that with real people all the time. People Assign drew Dagwood for years yeah. after someone died. So. Yeah. Why not let a computer do it? I don't think we're oh, that far off. That's interesting. Like, like, what if, if I'm just going to keep using you. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. What if Scott uh, says, when I die, uh, Mid Journey uh, gets the rights uh, to 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 my style of right. art, and right. they can they can charge people uh, to, to make art in the style of, of Scott Johnson. That, that would yeah. be an interesting way. Then you have block blockchain payments that go to my family and yeah, it's all yeah. good. Everything's good. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Real quickly, Logitech officially announced its G cloud gaming handheld running Android. Uh, it has a seven inch 1080p touchscreen with a 16, nine aspect ratio, 60 Hertz refresh rate. It's not a monster, uh, runs on a Snapdragon 720G processor, four gigabytes of RAM, 64 gigs of storage. The big draw is the battery. It's 6,000 milliamp hour battery. They're saying it'll get 12 hours of battery life. Uh, now it'll come with the Google Play Store. You'll be able to play Android games. But the other thing they're positioning it as is cloud gaming. They've worked with Microsoft and NVIDIA to optimize Xbox Cloud and GeForce Now to run well on this. You can buy it right now. The retail price is $350. It arrives October 17th, but there's a $100 discount if you order early. Yeah, quick quick comment on this. Um, I'm always interested in these devices. Just picked up a Steam Deck not long ago, and I've been loving that thing. Um, but they're they're obviously aimed at a very different thing. The fact that they're aiming this as just like almost entirely a cloud gaming device, uh, despite the fact that you can play Android games on it, it is it is powered for that. It is not powered for high end gaming really of any sort. These are this is all pretty slow. I think the only thing that will hold this back from being a huge hit is I think that price is ridiculous. It's too high. Yeah, for this thing, and I think if this was one ninety nine, and there was a fifty dollar discount for ordering it earlier, but your ultimate price is one ninety nine, I think they would sell these things like hotcakes, and it would go crazy. I think three forty nine is already in base Steam Deck uh, skew territory, so I don't know why you would do this. This seems way overpriced, and I love these sorts of things. I am into these portable gaming devices. Uh, likely this thing will also be great for, you know, retro gaming and other things, but so is a steam deck at that entry price. So I, I just don't know. I'm not sure why this is so expensive. It's my only hang up. Otherwise I think it looks like a fine piece yeah. of hardware. I mean, if it was windows at three fifty, then that would make sudden, maybe more sense. Yeah. It would be more capable. I, all I don't of a sudden know. My like, perception changes, but the fact that it's Android at three fifty, which is kind of silly since, you know, a Samsung galaxy phone is less capable in this in many ways. Gaming wise, anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's more capable in other ways, but you know that's going to cost you twelve hundred dollars. So, my uh, expectation is it'll be built really well, uh, and they uh, uh, Logitech knows how to make a nice little piece of hardware. Like none of those things are concerns to me. This sounds awesome. Uh, I just you know think that is. price is too high. It's not a loss leader for Logitech. Probably, you're right. They're not going to take a big loss. They're Why not going to make money off Steam. They're not. I mean, they'll make a little money off of uh, of affiliate revenue from recommending XCloud and GeForce Now, I suppose. But that's not the yeah. same as selling a bunch of games. Yeah, I think you're right. the The margins are slim on everyone else at the moment, with maybe Nintendo being the one exception. But they've also got this, you know, advantage of still making the same seven year old hardware or whatever it's been now mm-hmm. uh, for the switch. So, so it's just a weird handhelds are starting to become a big deal again. And with the Odin hitting the market and the uh, aforementioned steam deck and devices like this, there's tons of it on Amazon from various Chinese companies. Like we're in a bit of a renaissance for handheld and portable gaming. Yeah. I, I just wish it was a little more positioned 
price wise, but yeah. you know, whatever. I'll probably get one of these because I want to see and I want to review it. I'll let people know what I think. And that sounds like something you might talk about on one of your other shows. Uh, <laughs> what else you got going on these days? Well, you're right. Uh, the show would be Core. I do uh, actually play retro as well, but Core is the show where we talk about all the big goings on in the video game world. And uh, myself, uh, Bo Schwartz, and John Jagger host that show and have so much fun that it's entirely possible that we go like two and a half hours sometimes. That's how much we love doing it. We do it every Thursday. You might want to check it out if you're interested in any of the goings on in gaming, including this device. We'll be talking about that and so much more. You can find Core wherever you get your podcast. Just search for Core. And if you're looking for the website, it's at frogpants.com slash Core. Now, usually this is the part of the show where we uh, thank new patrons uh, for joining us. I don't know if we don't have any new patrons or if Patreon just has a glitch where it's not showing us because it's not showing me anything happening yesterday at all. <laughs> and sad as it is, usually you see somebody canceling if you don't see somebody signing up. Uh, and so I, I, if you have signed up, uh, hang in there. I'm sure the data will arrive and we will thank you then. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, if you haven't signed up, well, sign up patreon.com slash DTNS. In the meantime, I want to thank Matt DeFridis, uh, one of our lifetime supporters, been with us for a long time, been supporting at a high level. Uh, thank you for all the years of support, Matt. All right, patrons, stick around. I want to talk to, to Scott more about this AI art stuff on Good Day Internet. You can get that as a patron. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Nope, Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. <laughs> this show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>